folk, I want to consider this issue under the heading of who controls the climate. So I'm not here trying to discuss uh, all the issues as to whether it's happening or not, because um, I will deal with that, but that's not my major aim. My major aim is that those listening would understand that there is an issue here as to whether it's governed by us or whether it's governed by one above. And I'm going to show you quite unashamedly initially from the scriptures that it is the Lord God who actually controls the climate. Now that doesn't mean that he's tinkering every day with it, but I want to show you that he is in ultimate control of all things. We have a lot of climate alarmism today. Uh, we have, obviously, as you well know, well know that Greta Thunberg and uh, David Attenborough are very much in the lead on this. In other words, people from our country, of course, many from the US, many from Europe, it's mainly people from the West who are promoting this idea that we need to be alarmed concerning the climate. But I want to show you that what the Bible says about the climate. We need to realize, first of all, that the Bible makes it abundantly plain that the past was not the same as it is today. And I want to make that very much at the head of my talk. Because if you're a Christian here today, not all of you, sadly, but most of you will believe that the Bible really is the word of God. If the Bible really is the word of God and is our standpoint on everything, then as we maintain in Answers in Genesis and in all the talks that I do, it is the authority of the scripture which is our starting point, including Genesis. Now, Genesis, amazingly, of course, when you open that book, you come after the first few chapters talking about the fall, talking about the sin coming into the world, talking about the initial propagation of the human race in Genesis 5. Then you come to this almost frightening chapter, chapter 6, where chapter 6 speaks of the flood. Now, as you can see, I've put there the worldwide flood, not uh, a local flood. Now, there are plenty of people within the uh, community of Christians who are trying to argue that there was not a worldwide flood, but trying to say that it was a, a flood of local proportions and it only just affected the Middle East. And it wasn't really something to worry about in that sense. You know, it was just a little lesson that God was giving to his people at the time. Not so, because 2 Peter 3 refers to a worldwide flood. Many other passages refer to this. And the flood didn't just consist of, um, of um, volcanoes. Sorry, it didn't just consist of water. Excuse me, I've got a mistake here. I've got to minimize sorry about that i just had to minimize my um something on the screen because otherwise i wouldn't be able to see it so it's not just to do with water it includes volcanoes which warmed the oceans spewed ash into the atmosphere and caused one great ice age sorry about the spelling there the pre-flood world was lush with plentiful vegetation the post-flood world transition from a lush world to arid. How do we know that? Well, as we consider the evidence of the fossils, which I won't go into tonight, um, but I have done this in other talks, it's very evident that when you dig even under the Antarctic, that you've got evidence of lush growth everywhere. So the post-flood and the pre-flood world were very, very different to each other. And the post-flood era is what, of course, we are in now. Now, most people, particularly in the secular world, do not accept the flood. Now, I think it's a key issue that Christians need to believe in the flood if they're going to understand the climate change issues that 
uh, we have today. Now, we need to also see that in the Bible, even after the flood, in the time of Abraham, which is about BC 2000, if the Bible's true and I'm taking it to be true, that is my standpoint tonight, then we have to accept that the flood would be in the region of about two and a half thousand years ago. So we are dealing, therefore, with the time of Abraham somewhere in the region of 500 years after the flood. And it says here, the famine was grievous in the land. The Egyptians had the Nile to water their fields. And so Abraham went to Egypt, not because necessarily Egypt had uh, escaped all the uh, famine, but they had a great river which helped them. We don't know the details, but we certainly know that it was a grievous famine, it says there. Then there was a famine in the time of Isaac. In Genesis 26 and verse 1, it says there was a famine in the land beside the first famine, which we just mentioned, in the time of Abraham. So Isaac, it says, on that case, didn't go to Egypt. He went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gera. And in fact, the Lord expressly says, don't go to Egypt like Abraham had done before. Then we come to the time of Joseph. So I'm just realizing that you need to see here that I'm going from the flood through Abraham, through Isaac. Now coming on to Joseph, Genesis 41, verse 30, it says there shall arise after them seven years of famine and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine shall consume the land. Now this, of course, is years later. We've gone from the time of Isaac to the time, through the time of Jacob, although he's still alive at this point, but an old man. And we've come into the time of Joseph, where he is now basically prime minister under the Pharaoh. So we're looking into the period uh, somewhere around uh, BC, 1600, uh, no, not quite as late as that, BC 1800, somewhere in that region, in the time of Joseph, 1800, 1700, and then you'd move later on with the 400 years in Egypt, counting from Abraham, it would be somewhere in the region of BC 1500, or thereabouts, people are disagree as to the exact date for when they came out of Egypt. By the way, if you want to actually get a good DVD on this, Patterns of Evidence, uh, looks at that very issue, but that's not my topic tonight. But in the time of Joseph, it's clearly recorded that there was a severe famine. Now, I want to make an important point here. It says that there was a full seven years without rain. Now, if you want an example of real climate change, this is certainly one of them. People were desperate Jacob was desperate. We have the whole instant there as Joseph, of course, and his brothers were, um, well, his brothers weren't ex exactly uh, really wanting to go into Egypt because that would, uh, they, they, they were very, uh, it was a long way. And um, not that they knew that Joseph was there, of course, they'd thought that they'd got rid of him. But, uh, there, there came the issue, of course, about Benjamin, and uh, they eventually did go to Egypt, and then Joseph said, bring Benjamin. And the whole issue was obviously under God's control as he was actually bringing the brothers to repentance. But another theme running all the way through this is the seven years of plenty and the seven years of great trouble getting food. And this clearly wasn't due to industrial pollution. And yet there was a massive famine. And the, a point I do want to make here is that Nathaniel Jensen suggests in his writings, and he's a good geneticist, uh, tracing the world population with an understanding of how it might track back to Noah and then from Noah all the way back to Adam and Eve. And he shows that just by looking at the, uh, the genetic mutations, you can actually suggest a very consistent thesis 
for the genetic understanding of the spreading of the worldwide population. And in the process of doing that, he suggests that a good number of the people were actually living not that far away from the original place where the ark landed. And so he suggests that at this, even at this time of Joseph, which is probably about five, maybe 700, 700 years after the flood, the world population hadn't necessarily spread all the way through the world. And that when this famine came in the time of Egypt, you've got everybody coming to Egypt to get food. And what he's basically saying is that it was a world then, uh, it was a world problem. It was a world climate change. And even if the people had spread all the way through the world, actually it probably could even be a time of world climate change, literally world, but certainly all the population then, it is quite possible were coming under real pressure from famine. So seven years without rain. Most droughts and famines, of course, as if you read the scriptures, were due to the Lord dealing with either his own people or the world refusing to believe. The time of Elijah is another example. I won't go through them all tonight, but I'm just giving you some highlights. The time of Elijah, 1 Kings 17 and verse 1. This is the northern kingdom who had rebelled against God. And Elijah the Tishbite said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And you can see that commented on uh, in the time of, uh, sorry, in the New Testament, you'll find that Peter brings out this important matter concerning Elijah and his prayer and how important it is to pray. Sorry, it's Book of James. But you'll find that commented on in the New Testament. Three more examples, the book of Ruth. You all know that there was another famine uh, and Elkanah and Naomi went to Moab and there their sons married Moabites, including Ruth. And the story then unfolds as to eventually how Naomi, just with Ruth, comes back. And she says, I went out full and I came back empty. But there had been a famine in the land. That's in the land of Israel. Then 2 Samuel 21, there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered it is because of Saul and what he'd done in, in killing the Gibeonites, which they'd made a covenant with. In Matthew 24, verse 7, it says, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. There is no doubt that God controls the climate, according to the Bible. That last example that I've given you in Matthew 24 is talking about the future. It's talking about the years leading up to the time of Christ's return. And so all the way through the scriptures, not only in the past, but in the present by implication, but also in the future, certainly it's saying that God controls all things. We need therefore to come if we're as Christians with a view of the right authority of God's word. So, then what convinced people like David Attenborough and others about climate change? That's the line that I'm now going to follow concerning the science of supposed climate change. It's not that I'm totally skeptical about changes in the climate. Please understand where I'm coming from. But what I'm trying to do is to give you, as I've just done, a biblical worldview as being important. We should not ignore what the Bible says all the way through about the way famines occur. And famines are usually to do with the way the climate has changed. And it's not always, as I stressed, necessarily local. Let's see what The Independent in 2006 said. This is 
David Attenborough's words, I was skeptical about climate change. I was cautious about crying wolf, but I'm no longer skeptical. Now, I do not have any doubt at all. I think climate change is the major challenge facing the world. I've waited until the proof was conclusive that it was humanity changing the climate. The thing that really convinced me was the graphs connecting the increase of CO2, carbon dioxide, in the environment and the rise in temperature with the growth of human population and industrialization. The coincidence of the curves made it perfectly clear we have left the period of natural climatic oscillation behind and have begun on a steep curve in terms of temperature rise beyond anything in terms of increases that we have seen over many years. Now, that's a very important quote because it does show, we need to be fair to David Attenborough here, that he was coming with a relatively skeptical attitude, which is not a bad thing in science. We don't immediately come with a jumping to conclusions mentality. And to be fair to him, I don't agree with him, as you can gather, but to be fair to him, he was coming with thought, and that is important. We don't just jump immediately to saying that there has been a, a rise in temperature. But where, of course, we're going to differ is in some of the things that he says in that quote, if I could just pull it up again. Um, it's where he says that we were on a steep curve which had left the period of climatic oscillation. Now, this is an important point because he does admit that there is climatic os oscillation. And therefore we, we do note that reference. Now, a bit later on, in fact, only two years ago, Brian Appleyard in the Sunday Times, commenting on Attenborough, said, like the Queen, Attenborough must resist being too opinionated. For a while, this meant he was taking sides in the climate change argument until he was, he was wary, sorry, of taking sides until he was sure of the facts. About 15 years ago, it's actually 2004 when uh, uh, we're going to see that he really had a, a change of mind. About 15 years ago, a lecture by an American scientist, the late Ralph Cicerone, convinced him the evidence was beyond argument and his shows since then, the BBC TV and other programmes, have that he's conducted, he's conduct, concluded rather with a nod to the certainty of global warming. I must admit, I noticed that in David Attenborough's wildlife films. Now, we could go through graphs and pictures of the melting of the sea ice. This is a particular uh, useful uh, graph which shows how the sea ice area has reduced over a period from 1979 originally through to 2004. So nobody denies these curves because they're well documented. And there are other things though, which are not necessarily just going back 20 or 30 years. These ones are going back a bit further, but still I'm relatively happy with the data which is being shown here. This is the carbon dioxide concentration going all the way back to 1958, um, measured at Hawaii. And they are doing this by direct measurement of the concentrations in parts per million by volume. So you're looking there on the uh, vertical part of the graph, the vertical line, figures from 300 to 390, 
and it's showing that all the way up to 2004, there's been a steady increase. And it is derived, as it says in the caption, from in situ samples collected in Hawaii. So we call this the Keeling curve, which uh, is well known in the climate change community. And in the same lecture, which Ralph Cicerone gave in 2004, these are old graphs, and I've deliberately chosen the old graphs. I'm going to show you better quality ones shortly. But you'll see that at the bottom, it's got methane, CH4, and at the top, it's got carbon dioxide. Both those curves are in red. But you'll notice a distinct change in the line along the bottom, whereas the previous curves were looking at recent times when people could actually measure things. These set of curves, please note, are measuring, again, temperature on the left. And when it's dealing with carbon dioxide and methane, you've got those parts per million on the right. And that's true for the red curves. And then there is a temperature difference curve, which is using the uh, vertical axis on the left temperature. But what I want you to note is what's at the bottom. It says age in thousands of years. BP it doesn't mean British Petroleum. It means before the present. So when you go from the right there, naught, that means basically now, although this is in 2004, so it's slightly earlier, and it then has a, a number minus 50. So it's already talking about minus 50,000 years. Then it goes further back, minus 100,000 years, until eventually we get to a half a million years on the far left. Now, what were they doing? Well, actually, what they were doing, these scientists, were not measuring, not, and I stress, not measuring directly the temperature. What they were doing is they were taking ice core data, ice core samples, as it says here, from an Antarctic ice core in the, in the Vostok Antarctic um, part of the uh, Antarctic. And this is in a prestigious journal, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it's actually saying that they measured the amount of methane, which is not an easy thing to do, but it is possible. I'm not necessarily doubting those measurements of methane and carbon dioxide, because you can take the sample, you have to be careful about mixing the ice with the, uh, with the air that's trapped inside, because in ice there's always air trapped inside, and it's the air that they're interested in, not so much the ice. If you melt the ice, then you've got the possibility that the water will absorb some of the air, actually dissolve it. So you have to be very careful, what they try to do is do it in a, a low temperature environment and you separate the ice, you extract the air very carefully and you measure what's in the air. So I don't necessarily doubt these figures for the oscillation that you can see as you go with, an, with ice core samples lower in the ground, then they are saying that as you go from right to left, you're going through tens of thousands of years. That's where I disagree. I don't think you're doing that at all. Now, there is a lot of work here, which is very difficult for me to summarize. And maybe if I do uh, another talk on this, I'll perhaps put in a slide, but I'm just gonna have to do it verbally tonight. But Michael Ord has actually very carefully considered the issue of ice cores and shown that there is a massive amount of assumptions when people start saying that these are from a certain time in history. You don't actually know that because if you believe in a catastrophic event, i.e. the global flood, which I'm going to come to, it has implications for ice forming, then 
you could have massive amounts of variation in the ice layers all in a single year. And indeed, even if it's over two, three hundred years, which I'll come to in a moment, could well be the issue after the flood, then you'll get a lot of variation in the ice forming, which is nothing to do with annual variations that we have today. And indeed, they could all be compacted by a lot of ice forming above. So we do not know that those uh, lines along the bottom are in fact true. And of course, this is a later graph, which is a bit better. It's not come from the same talk. And this is one which makes it a little bit clearer what's going on. You'll see something at the top right, which is a red line, um, which is to do with the methane and a blue line to do with the carbon dioxide going way up into somewhere in the region of 400 parts per million. Now, this is a helpful graph. If you look at the line along the top, please look at the line along the top. You've got 3,300 meters. We didn't have this on the previous graph that I showed you. This graph actually shows you what a bit better what's going on. 3,300 meters depth, 3,200 meters depth, 3,000 and so on, all the way up to uh, the value on the right there. Now, what I want you to note is that the real data is not the temperature here. The temperature was a deduction, which I'll come to in a moment as to how they did it. But what I want you to note is that the real data that one's looking at here is oxygen isotopes, which is the brown line, which is four line, four curves down. And you're looking at the methane, which is the green line. And you're looking at the carbon dioxide, uh, which is the blue line. So the actual data is the blue line, the green line, and the uh, oxygen um, isotope. It's oxygen is normally 16, but you can get isotopes of oxygen, which then increases the molecular or the, uh, the atomic weight. Uh, well, it is the molecular weight, O2, up to uh, 18 instead of uh, 16. So oxygen atom is eight. And when you've got oxygen molecule, it's usually 16, but it can with an isotope go up to 80. So they're looking for this particular isotope. Now the isotope, if you read the uh, caption here, is the key to what they're doing. Um, from bottom to top, you've got the solar variation at 65 degrees north due to what are uh, Milankovitch cycles, which I'll come to in a moment. And he talks about, the, they talk about the isotope of oxygen. The levels of methane, which I've referred to, then the relative temperature, which is the red curve, which again I'll come to, the levels of carbon dioxide, which I've referred to, and then uh, it talks about the, um, the isotope, the brown line there. So, these, these actual curves, the important ones, which are the ones that you can actually say they measured are the carbon dioxide, the blue line, the red line, which is the methane, uh, beg your pardon, the green line, which is the methane, and the isotope, which is the brown line. Now, they deduced the temperature. Now, they may not be wrong on the temperature, but the temperature is a deduction on the basis of what they reckon that if you were to heat the atmosphere a bit, what would be the constituents parts of the atmosphere, and in particular how the oxygen isotope, the 18 isotope, would vary. So they're basing their temperature variations on the isotope. Now, that may not be wrong. But the big thing, which of course is wrong, is that they are attributing a certain depth to an age, very similar to radioisotope dating, where there are massive assumptions when it comes to these millions of years that they deduce. 
And of course, it's all to do with how much of the parents was there and the daughter element in the beginning, which you don't know. And it's also to do with calibrating that radiometric clock. And you just do not know what the certainties are. And you have a similar problem here. It's, it's basically ice core dating. And they try to get it right with tree rings, but only that can, the only way you can be sure of getting tree rings data is in the first 5,000 years. And then you try and marry that with the, with the ice core variations. And frankly, there's no way you can calibrate that curve for supposedly 400,000 years. So I dwelt on that because it's important to see what's going on. Now, the, this is another chart, uh, which basically is saying the same thing. But uh, what I want you to notice is that they're trying to say that there is a close agreement lasting hundreds of thousands of years between the inferred temperatures, and I've already told you how that was done, and global ice volumes, which in this case is the red curve, at the bottom. And so they're trying to say that the ice volume is following the temperature curves, which it probably is. But again, they haven't done a direct measurement. Nobody was there to actually check that. The red line is global ice volume inferred from chemical measurements in deep sea sediment cores. So to be fair to them, they are trying to say that um, the ice cores, which are to do with the top two curves, blue and green curves, are in agreement with deep sea sediment cores. And in a sense, they are. There is actually a tracking through. But they've got a problem here because you do not know the time scale along the bottom of either of them. It looks as though it's an independent clarification. But actually, if you read, the literature, and it's well worth getting a copy of this book, which I'll advertise at the end again, which is by Jake Herber, which is called The Climate Change Conflict, and it's published by Institute of Creation Research, but there's also a very helpful booklet um, in the small book a series that Answers in Genesis produced, produces, which is simply called climate change, or you can get bigger volumes from both organizations, you will find actually that what appears to be an independent uh, com confirmation is in fact not the case. Despite appearances, the charts such as this one are not strong arguments either from an old earth or for I'm coming to it, an astronomical theory, which is often used to bolster the view of climate change today. There are large assumptions concerning dating of the ice cores, which I've just mentioned, and the temperature changes are inferred from constituent isotopes of gases in the ice cores. That may be true, but it's not a direct measurement. The data, in fact, simply shows fluctuations uh, from a biblical point of view, which are consistent with one ice age after the flood. And that's what I'm going to come to and move towards. Now, we need to talk about global mean temperatures because in the last um, 10, 15, 20 years, there has been a lot of discussion about what's called the hockey stick graph, the famous hockey stick graph which was produced by a man, Bradley and Hughes in 1999. And the curve says that the temperature in the last 1,000 years has not been varying hugely, but now it is going way up and we are in danger of a rapid rise in terms of uh, warmth in the planet and therefore a danger of sea level rises. Now we need to be very careful about these global mean temperatures. We're not saying necessarily that the last 10, 20 years is incorrect, but what we need to see is how this measures compared 
with the earlier temperatures in this graph. There is actually quite a lot of discussion, even in the secular literature, about this hockey stick graph. You probably know that there was uh, what's called climate gate, climate gate, which took place uh, uh, about 10 years ago, um, 2006, a bit longer than that, 14 years ago, when um, the University of East Anglia published um, their, their literature and said that everything is showing that we've got runaway temperatures forming. But people then began to realize that there was a lot of collusion going on, a lot of uh, altering even of the data. And eventually, even in the secular world, uh, it was admitted that there was a lot of graphs which they hadn't shown in that man paper. They were omitted, or it was argued they were superseded by later re reconstructions. Or, as it says here, or due to data plotting issues. Actually, it was more than data plotting issues. It does seem to have been alterations of the data. Let me just summarize really what's happened. The data that I've just shown you there, right? And we're only going to look at the right hand side of this graph. We're going to measure it from about 1300, 1400 onwards, okay? That data is here, right? So it's an expanded version and you can see the dip that we had before. I'll just go back so you can see that I'm not trying to hoodwink you on this. We're going from 1400 up to the present. We're looking at the bottom graphs, right? The bottom graph, I'll just go back here. You can see that it's essentially the man diagram from the middle, right? 1400 to today. So it is essentially that graph. And you can see it again here. You can see the red line from about 1400 and going through what we call the Little Ice Age. And he does admit it that there was an ice, little ice age, it's called. I'll come to that in a moment. And then going up. But what really was the data? The corrected version is this one. Please note that the 20th century, which is today, uh, not today, but beg your pardon, it shows that I was born in the 1950s. Uh, it's the 21st century now, but anyway, the 20th century and going on into the first 20 years that we're in now of the 21st century is not the highest temperature. The highest temperature was indeed estimated, of course, this is not data that you could be utterly sure of, but there is lots of records of the medieval period, and it's called the medieval warm period. We'll come to the Little Ice Age in a moment, but there was a medieval warming period. How do we know that? Well, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of ancillary records which showed that everything was quite warm in those periods before the 1600s which we're coming to when it got very cold everything indicates that it was pretty warm some of the literature refers to it that we do have so much is as here is estimated but it it is regarded as quite reasonable to say that it was about half degree warmer than today and that there was oscillations but that then it became a very cold period now you can read about that in these uh, this paper corrections to man et al 1998 and in the actual paper that we're looking at here is mcintyre and mckittrick and it shows that the Earth's temperature over the last 600 years has actually been warm first before it became cold. Now we come to the 1600s, the time of uh, the early Puritans. And you'll see here that it was quite common for uh, ice skating in the winter. And of course, it is well known that the Thames froze over, but it, it never does that today. So there was this very cold period in the 1600s and the 1700s. 
So the correct temperature plot is that one, not the other one, which has big implications. Well, now we need to address this issue of the Ice Age. We believe, as Christians who believe the Bible, that in fact it was only one Ice Age. But let's just assume for a moment that we're just following the secular literature. We know we've got a problem in actually these ice core, um, uh, the, these ice cores which they are using to uh, say that what the temperatures were before and they have extended them all the way back into the past in tens of hundreds of thousands of years, tens, then hundreds of thousands of years. Well, what in fact was really going on? Well, I'm going to show you that secular climate theorists have a way of getting an ice age. They know that really you need very, uh, you need obviously cold to do it. But what, what they do say is that you need just cold winters, failing to realize that actually you need mild winters and cool summers. And the moisture content of the cold air, if you go very, very cold, it's well known if you go to the Antarctic, that some parts of that Antarctic don't have a huge amount of snowfall. The moisture content of cold air is much less than that of warmer air. And the less moisture in the air means less precipitation and hence less snowfall. So actually what you need is mild winters and cool summers. You don't want actually hugely cold winters in order to form an ice age. That might sound counterintuitive, but this is well known as, a, as an issue. So the secularists say, OK, we've got the answer. It's astronomy. There is Milankovic cycles. The orbit of the Earth undergoes wobbles which has caused a variation in the amount of the sun's radiation reaching the earth. So they ignore this issue about having not very cold winters because they don't actually have a mechanism for producing mild winters and cool summers. But we'll just part that problem for a moment. They want some cold and this is how they try to get it. It is argued that there is a precession in the rotation of the earth that it's processing as it wobbles on its axis and this procession is not the only issue you've also got an eccentricity in the motion of the earth going around the sun so the, the precession is one issue which is the bit on the right on this diagram and you've also got the change in the eccentricity of the elliptical orbit, which is highly emphasized here, uh, of the Earth around the Sun. You've also got another change, which is to do with the tilt of the Earth with respect really to the stars. And then you've got this precession as well. Anyway, when you come to thousands of years and the change of the amount of radiation hitting the Earth, you do get a sine wave. But the problem is that the amount of variation is minuscule. Fred Hoyle, who died many years ago, likened this theory to saying that you've got night time heaters, right, storage heaters coming on at night time, and you are going to change the temperature of a room by bringing in an ice cube. And he's basically saying that it's minuscule, the effect of the Milankovic effect. And he's right. And actually, those who adopt this theory know that they've got a problem. The secularists know this. We've got a quote here from a gentleman called Kerr, where, who wrote way back in 1997, where he says paleoclimatologists, that's people who study ancient climates, have long realized, recognized that the amount of Milankovitch induced change in solar heating is too small to melt glaciers or to send Earth into a deep freeze. Unless some has yet 
some as yet unidentified part of the climate system amplifies it. Well, this is where, and I'm going to have to hurry here. This is where, sorry, this is where coming back to what we were looking at before, I need to bring it in right back here. This is where this curve, which I showed you with carbon dioxide variation and the carbon dioxide going really high in the atmosphere today, Please look on the extreme right, top right of this graph. This is where, this is the answer. They say, I'm sorry to say it so strongly, but I'm trying to sort of just emphasize that from a secularist point of view, they have a problem in getting the variation um, in order to produce the ice. So they haven't really quite got the level they need from the Milankovic variation. It's like putting an ice cube into a room with storage heaters, Fred Hoyle said, okay? And that frankly is known to be a problem. So they say, ah, but the sensitivity of the earth to carbon dioxide is much greater than the data might appear to say, because the data for the sensitivity of the Earth's temperature to carbon dioxide alone is actually not much more than about half a degree. So they say, ah, but the sensitivity must be much more. And so they have climate computer models which increase that sensitivity without really knowing where that sensitivity comes from. And you can read about it in the secular literature. That is the issue. How sensitive is the Earth's atmosphere to carbon dioxide? I haven't enough time to go into detail here, but can I just say this? There is one other gas which nobody talks about in the secular literature. But, well, they do talk about it, but they sort of say, well, we don't know enough about it. That gas is simply water vapor. Water vapor is to do with cloud formation. And the big no-no in the climate models today is that they don't know how to model cloud formation because cloud formation is hugely complicated in the Earth's atmosphere. Well, let me come to an end to this, this talk because I want to show you now, having, uh, having talked about Milankovic cycles, I want to now come back to the scriptures. The biblical flood, 4,500 years, provides exactly the right scenario in order to perform an ice age. Because we've got to have an ice age in order to understand the data in the past. Now do you see where I'm going? Because as soon as you understand properly the data in the past, then you can begin to actually say what's happening concerning the future. They reckon that we're going into huge oscillations to do with the Milankovic cycles, which is something of the order of uh, 90,000 years, if you look back at these cycles here. And some the, the, the smallest one would be about 20,000 years. <laughs> but we're saying that the earth is much younger than that. And that there was a worldwide flood four and a half thousand years ago. There is much evaporation gone into the atmosphere that produced many clouds all over the world. Not just clouds of water vapor, but clouds full of particulate matter from the volcanic eruptions. There would be cool summers, and there would be moderate winters, exactly what you need. So the summers were cooled down, but we're not talking about hugely violently cold winters. What you need is a lot of precipitation, and that's exactly what you get. Precipitation at the poles and within the Arctic and the Antarctic Circle, much snow, thus causing glaciation over a period of 300 to 400 years. So this summarizes it here. Aerosols, this is taken from Jake Herbert's excellent book. Uh, the aerosols reflecting the sunlight, cooler summers, and the aerosols is to do with this particulates from the volcanoes. So it's not just clouds, 
a lot of evaporations increase snowfalls. Now, we need to just comment on water vapor. Water vapor capacity at saturation, which is about 11% relative humidity versus temperature. So we're talking here of um, a relative humidity kept fixed. We're talking about the capacity of water vapor, right? Um, to actually stay in the atmosphere. And it, this is showing that you get a 60% drop in the capacity as the temperature cools from 10 degrees to minus two, which means basically you're going to get a lot of precipitation. Now, this is commenting on Michael Lord. It actually comes from another article which you can pick up for yourself in Answers Research Journal back in 2010. Let me just read the highlighted part. This is talking about Michael Ord. Warm seas worldwide following the flood would produce optimum conditions for initiating the ice age. It would have been like lake effect storms greatly enhanced. Michael Ord uh, estimated that 500 to 700 years would have been required for the ice age to reach its maximum. Now that, that's a very interesting comment. The uh, the worldwide flood roughly four and a half thousand years ago, BC 2500. So that would mean that the ice was still coming through Abraham's time. It would also mean that Job uh, would be in the middle of the ice age. We, hence, a lot of references you'll find there to snow. Very interesting that Job, probably the oldest writings in the whole Bible. During this time, more snow would have been precipitated than winter that would have melted in the summer. Consequently, the snow cover would have increased in thickness and lateral extent. As the polar seas cooled, less evaporation would have translated into less snow. And eventually snowfall would equal melting, stabilizing the extent of glaciation. And so it goes on. Please notice, though, right at the bottom, it says that the high ice plateau of Antarctica receives only about one inch of precipitation each year. Even Al Gore acknowledged this fact. Today's precipitation rate does not allow sufficient time to accumulate the nearly two mile glacier thickness, which you do get from a biblical time frame. So what I'm saying to you is that there was a catastrophe in the past. There was a global heating event. Then there was a global cooling event. This is the major reason for those graphs in the past. Then there would be oscillation in the ice cores as the world had a huge amount of ice at the poles. There would have been a lot of instability in those times but now the world comes to a much more stable time but is seeing some heating but it's not heating as much as people think they are worried about heating in the future but actually evidence shows and i haven't had time to deal with this that when you consider the sun's variation of heat heating the earth and we haven't had time to consider that there is a small variation in the sun's heat it's about an 11 year cycle and it goes in the sunspot cycle now it's not sufficient to explain everything but it does suggest that cloud cover is changed as a result of sunspot activity this has an effect on storm activity and so many people think that there is going to be eventually a period of cooling again. We don't know for sure, but even if we're wrong, it's not actually uh, something which is totally out of control as people try to make out. And it certainly isn't to do with people heating the planet and breathing out carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide rise and fall is simply due to the heating up of the oceans, which under uh, 
cooler conditions absorb more carbon dioxide and under warmer conditions give out that carbon dioxide. So rather than the CO2 being the cause, the CO2 actually is a product of the heating of the oceans. The real catastrophe to come is similar in terms of a God-given event to the flood that I mentioned in the past. The hems of the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. Just as the Lord says in Luke 17, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. In the days of the Son of Man. And it says the flood came and destroyed them all. That is what we should really be concerned about. The present world is going to be destroyed by fire. Yes, there is a warming. But friends, I don't joke. This is a very serious issue. Let me therefore say to you that global warming isn't the major issue. That actually the major issue is whether we are safe or not. In the flood, you were lost if you didn't get into the ark. You were saved if you got into the ark. We can be saved today by coming to the cross where Jesus Christ bled and died that we might be forgiven. That is the crucial issue. It's not, sorry, it's not the issue as people maintain um, that we, we somehow need to worry about the planet. God has the planet under his control and he calls all men everywhere to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to me. I'm going to uh, close now.